how churches turned men into girls. <laughs> um, just want you to see the lookout up here before I start down the trail again. And uh, very beautiful. Um, but I want to talk about this little subject here because I've seen a lot of people make this observation and I want to say some things. I might have to switch cameras here because I'm just about out of battery power and I don't have an extra battery for this particular camera that I'm holding. But we'll start back down the steep hill. But I want to make a number of points about the thing of how churches uh, turn men into girls. Well, we're gonna go way back in time, back into the 1800s. Back then you had, uh, there weren't that many church buildings. Uh, what you had was meeting houses. Little small buildings, little one room church type of things. And these meeting houses were built by people without debt. They were, uh, uh, man, this is really precarious going down here. Um, but these church houses, they were just small little buildings. People would get together, they'd build a place where you could come and hear some preaching and teaching. And um, I don't really have a big, huge problem with that. I think that that's okay to have a building to meet in. Uh, they met in an upper room in Acts chapter two. Uh, the problem is when you start to get into all kinds of debt and you build these huge, big, Masonically inspired temples, then you're starting to get away from the New Testament there. But the old time preachers, um, I've read their work, read their about their sermons, and those guys were, were they were very rough in their preaching. You know, you hear the term of hell, fire, and damnation preaching. That's what those guys preached. They were uh, pretty rough, pretty brutal with their preaching. They weren't afraid to tell people that they were going to hell and that people that they were in sin and whatever else. Um, and you know what? It's good for you to hear that. You want to be around a preacher that will get you convicted and make you feel bad about being in sin. Uh, remember years ago, there was a street preacher, James Lyman, rather caustic fellow, and um, <laughs> went to a Baptist church where he was speaking and he was just ripping people, you know, to shreds about not going out and you know doing street work and whatever else and it convicted me it convicted me badly and uh, i came forward at the end and you know knelt down and said lord help me to do this i i'm not really into the street ministry thing and but i'm gonna go out i promise and i showed up the next week and ironically of all the other people that went forward and knelt down you know i was the only one that came Hmm. They uh, talked themselves out of it by the end of the week or throughout the week there. I didn't. I felt convicted and I came out. And I did street ministry for years, going door to door and preaching on the street and passing out gospel tracts and all that other stuff. Inviting people to church. Did all of that. But uh, it was because of a preacher ripping my hide off. And... Uh, you know, reading a lot of the old sermons, the hellfire and damnation type preachers, the pulpit pounders, you know. Uh, that was good preaching back then. But um, <clears throat> those preachers soon became replaced by textual critics. The uh, Westcott and Hort critical Greek text came out in the uh, late 1800s. They came out with a revised version in 1881. And then the whole revised that was just the new testament and then the whole revised version in 1884 85 in that area and um then it became in vogue as a preacher to stand up there and question the text of the king james bible well actually here the greek word would be better translated and the greek word and the hebrew and the you know and they primarily the greek that they were attacking they attacked the new testament and you can get into that whole thing what it was all about and the uh forgery of Sinaiticus in the mid 1800s by Constantine Simonides. You can get into that whole thing and uh, the Masonic conspiracy of the whole thing. A lot of those preachers were Freemasons that were coming out and questioning the text of the King James Bible, trying to destroy the people's faith in it. They ultimately succeeded. But, um, so, you know, that became the norm. Going up into the 1950s, even the time when I was born and raised in the 70s 
and growing up in the 80s, and I remember hearing preachers talking about, now a better reading would be, now if you look at the Greek here, the New American Standard is better translation than the King James, and, and that's all that they did. They inspired doubt in the Bible. And I knew so many Christians growing up that would uh, say that they're a Christian, but then I'd say, do you believe the Bible's perfect? No, there's no such thing as a perfect Bible. And I used to always think, that doesn't make any sense. If there's no perfect Bible, then how do you know that you're saved? Kind of weird. But, um, <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, so again, you go from hellfire and damnation preaching to now uh, guys that aren't sure, and I'm not really, uh, you know, this text here, it, it would be better translated, and it's, a, it's an unfortunate translation, and all this other stuff. And this has led many people to doubt, and so that started to effeminize the men that went to these church buildings. Next, you had the 501c3 tax exemption of the 1960s under uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson came out. And now you had, um, if you want tax exemption, you want the government to look the other way and you don't have to pay taxes as a church building, which you didn't have to before, but now you can have official government permission. And in exchange, what we'll do for you is um, we'll give you tax exemption if you refuse to speak about politics and certain other controversial issues in your church building. And so a lot of people went with that. A lot of people said, okay, um, we'll do that. We'll become tax exempt statuses. And that's why you hear preachers to this very day. And they'll say, I can't tell you who to vote for. And they'll go to marry somebody and they'll say, and now by the power invested in me by the state of whatever state you're in, you think to yourself, shouldn't it be the power invested in me by the Lord? No, no, by the state. <laughs> okay. Well, that effeminized the men even more. Because now, hey, we aren't allowed to talk about who to vote for. We aren't allowed to talk about uh, anything that would affect public policy. Um, because we could get in trouble. We could lose our church building. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the huge financial debts that come about as a result of having these big, huge church buildings. You have that too. Um, you know, we have this million dollar building now and we have to pay it off. So let's just kind of tone the message down a little bit here. So it's less offensive, you know, tiptoe through the tithers. You know what I mean? All right, I'm back. The uh, battery died on me there. So I apologize for that. I have to use another camera. I only had one battery for the other camera. So, um, but you'll still be able to hear me and see me. Um, Beginning back to what I was saying, the thing of huge financial debts. They got themselves into all kinds of debt, building these huge big church buildings. And then of course, it switches from, you know, biblical evangelism to now a seeker-sensitive church corporation uh, where we have to be so careful. Uh, we cannot offend people. We have to make sure that these people are return customers. I mean, uh, congregants and uh, get them coming back and make sure we get 10% of their tithe money. Even though 10% tithe is nowhere found in scripture. Not at all. Uh, you'll never see anybody giving 10% of their income to a church building. Whoa, as I slip. <laughs> That's what makes this fun. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, that effeminized men even more. And then what's next? Well, you have a whole generation of men that were put through Sunday school growing up, and um, they're taught by women. And you know, in Sunday school, it's okay, children. You know, let's let's all sing the the special songs. And Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, and you're going through these songs, and now the message of the song might not be bad, but the way it's presented is not so good. And I remember being a boy, and, um, you know, we were, I was raised as a country boy, and, you know, we fought, we were rough, we'd play pool pranks on each other and things, and, and I remember different times we'd have fist fights in Sunday school, boys would get ticked off about something, they'd start beating each other up, you know, and the Sunday school teacher would come in and, no, 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 stop! You know, and then 
make them hug or something, you know, and say that they're sorry and they're forgiven and all this other stuff, you know. <laughs> and they started to take away the thing of, you know, boys being boys, boys being raised to be men. And so you have multiple generations now of church going men that were raised in these effeminate Sunday schools. Just telling the truth. And uh, that's a problem. And of course, the new Vatican versions, the new versions that come out and they say, you know, if you have street slang or whatever your preferences are, we'll rewrite the Bible to, to match your feelings and your opinions. It's not right. It's not supposed to be that way. Uh, the Bible is supposed to change us. We don't change the Bible to fit our needs. And uh, another thing that's there. And of course you have the issue that these new versions from the Vatican, um, that's what they are, made, in, made under the supervision of the Vatican, the Nestle Alon text, 27th edition. You can see it right in the introduction, the forward to it or whatever. Now I guess it's an introduction. They talk about, you know, uh, an agreement between the Vatican and about, you know, translations made under their supervision. So I'm not just saying, I'm not just talking. The Vatican does produce these new versions. And it's specifically to take away the Holy Spirit power of the King James Bible, which has been proven time and time again. And of course you have the mother of all harlots, the Roman Catholic Church, and that mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, her spirit is now in the church buildings. I mean, she's the one who created the, the concept of church buildings to, you know, uh, synchronize or syncretize or whatever they call it, uh, pagan beliefs and Christian beliefs, so we can all get along. We can unite under one banner, under one authority. The church, the holy church. Um, yeah, that's what they do. And of course, they brought in rock and roll music to these church buildings. Uh, not church, not music that puts down the flesh, but uh, music that uplifts the flesh. Let's have worship and praise. And I just want to praise Jesus. Let's just have a worship. Everybody close your eyes, put your hands up. Let's feel this thing. And get the music going so loud that you can hear it for 100 yards away outside of the church building. It's an abomination. Lifting up the flesh. You say, I don't agree. Well, then you're uh, rejecting science. Uh, rock and roll was a street slang term in the blues community back in the early 1900s for uh, fornication in the back seat of a vehicle. Got that van rocking and rolling, or that car or whatever. That's what it means. Look it up. I'm not making that up. Well, but we can make a Christian version of that so we can reach out to the lost. Uh -huh. You know, somebody's in a quicksand and they need help getting out of the quicksand. Let's jump into the quicksand to help them out of the quicksand. No. The sinful world is what you need to get out of. The wicked lusts of the flesh. The satanic practices out there. You need to get out of that. Not uh, join with it and whatever else. I mean, how can you get saved if you're lifting up the flesh? You have to crucify the flesh with the lusts and, and affections and things. You're supposed to put down the flesh as a Christian. Not exalt it, not lift it up. But you see, what did it do? Oh, I don't know. Created some effeminate men. They go to church. You know? Now you come to these modern church buildings. You go in there, and I've been in a few. And uh, you go in there, and it's, Can I give you a hug? I just had the love of Jesus. You know, they got this lifty little thing of Jesus. Like a little snaky thing, you know, thing that they do with their hissing. Oh, I've heard it. You probably heard it too if you go to these modern churches and you listen to them on YouTube or wherever else. Uh, it's an abomination. It's disgusting. Um, but the way that you can really tell that these church buildings are satanic and wicked is over the fact of how they treat the elderly. Oh, uh, you know, I heard uh, some advertisement for SD Bullion, I think it was, and uh, some wicked modern CCM thing. And we just want to share our faith. It said something about share our faith. We had these special bullion bars made and whatever. Let's share our faith. And it was some satanic song this guy says about, I don't want to be stuck in the good old days. 
What does that mean? You modern satanic antichrists out there calling yourselves Christians. Oh, you don't want to be stuck in the good old days. Uh, really? Uh, you know, I can't relate to my the religion of my grandparents and maybe even some to their parents. Why? I mean, where does the Bible say that things are going to get better in the end times? Evil men and seducers shall wax better and better. <laughs> no, it says worse and worse. Oh no, you know, the Antichrist comes and, you know, before the Antichrist shows up, there's a, a new movement, this great movement of the Lord. Oh yeah, we, we're doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. Remember DC Talk had a song like that, that satanic band that they were. I used to actually listen to that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I mean that. <laughs> Makes God sick and should make a Christian sick as well. But, um, so you want to know why church buildings and how they made men such sissies and little girly men? Uh, don't fight. Don't uh, get angry about certain things. Don't, you know, righteous indignation is divisive. Don't be too militant. You know, standing up for one Bible, is, it's a divisive issue. Can we talk about this someplace else? Remember that I, I did this, uh, there's some YouTube channel. And um, I forget what the guy's name is. Some uh, pretends to be a country guy or something. He does uh, country songs or something, buddy something or other. Don't remember the name of the channel, but he's got all these subscribers. And it was, you know, this uh, why are Christians afraid to play this guy's baptism in church or something? And I thought, okay, I'll bite. See what this is all about. I had a feeling. I thought to myself, I'm sure the guy that just got baptized is probably going to do some very wicked thing. And, um, and... I wasn't disappointed, watched the video, and the other guy gets baptized and they said, this little hireling guy, and he's there and he goes, um, you know, why, uh, why did you want to get baptized? And the guy's standing there, you know, tattooed heathen and everything, and he says, oh, he says, well, because I was a real piece of S word. Um, you know, that's one why I wanted to get baptized. Um, the Holy Spirit moved into that guy? Uh, see, having a cuss word come out of your mouth, it slips out because you're angry or whatever, your flesh gets the better of you. No judgment coming from me. But when you have people that are unrepentant and they can just use profanity, no conviction, no feelings, no whatever. And again, some guy gets a tattoo back when he's lost. No judgment from me. None. But when you get people that are just tattooing all the time and they're professing Christians, uh, the Holy Spirit's not leading you. The Holy Spirit's not in you. And you know, I want to say something also about this whole issue. I fear many times that I'm too lenient. When I listen to the old time preachers, when I mean, they physically would beat people up. I mean, if they were attacked or whatever else, they'd attack back, they'd fight back. Uh, the story of Peter Cartwright Methodist circuit riding preacher, if you can imagine that, a Methodist. Now they're so feminine and whatever else, and the only arguing they do is whether they should allow the sodomites to preach. But uh, Peter Cartwright, uh, there was a saloon owner, tavern, bar, or whatever you want to call it, and uh, Methodist Christians were going out and trying to preach in front of this place to get it shut down. Now show me Methodists that are doing that today. And, um, you know, and this bar owner would go out and he'd beat these Christians up. And Peter Cartwright was a huge giant man. I think he was something like six foot eight or something crazy. I mean, he was a huge guy. And he went, heard about this, went to the saloon owner and went up and said, started, you know, trying to preach to the guy or something. And the guy, you know, you get out of here with your blankety blank blank, start cussing him out. Cartwright knocked him down, knocked him on the ground and then sat on his chest and started punching him in the face, singing all hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> uh, people come into the campfire meetings and things, their revival meetings. Peter Cartwright, a couple different times, he'd pick up a burning piece of wood out of a campfire, throw it at them. They were physical. Dwight Lyman Moody, D.L. Moody, uh, was doing a 
one of his evangelistic preaching, you know, campaigns. And a guy came up onto the platform afterwards. He's, you know, shaking people's hands. Guy came up and said something filthy about Moody's wife. Moody grabbed the guy, threw him down a flight of stairs. The steps coming up to the platform. Just grabbed him, <laughs> threw him down the steps. Other preachers, you know, people stand up in the crowd start yelling at them. And they just stop preaching. They'd yell right back at the guy. And, you know, one guy jumped off the platform, ran down, and started hitting the guy. To some other congregation members, some men in the congregation, men, you know, in the congregation got up and dragged the bum out. Quit trying to interrupt the service. We don't care what you have to say. And uh, preaching about sin, an intolerant attitude towards sin. Well, those old time guys, they had it. And uh, they'd put people in their place. They really would. And Satan used the uh, church buildings to effeminize the men, like I just explained to you. So, uh, something to think about, and see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.